I think today I'm supposed to talk about, uh, um, well, it says large scale, but um, basically largemouth bass uh, egg acquisition or basically production of largemouth bass eggs. Uh, do a lot of work with largemouth bass. I do a lot of work with Florida largemouth bass and Guadalupe bass. So I'll I'll try to stay on point with which one I'm talking about at the time. I'll mostly stay with largemouth bass and mostly Florida largemouth bass. But every once in a while, there's some good stuff that we've done that applies to largemouth bass uh, um, that we've done that we've done specifically with Guadalupe bass. And one of the things uh, we do here. Uh, I know we do in a lot of places with with aquaculture is we solve an aquaculture problem uh, with aquaculture science and it's very good science, but we don't publish it. So um, some of the stuff, oh, I wish we would have gotten published by now. But anyway, so uh, not knowing exactly the, the audience, um, I'll stick with more of an intensive side. We can move this around if anybody wants to in terms of questions of you know this is basically intensive so we did we deal with 80 foot raceways uh 13 000 gallon um concrete raceways and what we like to do with large mouth bass which is a a pretty pliable uh predator if you will large mouth bass uh do well in an aquaculture setting better than some people think they are kind of a pain because they don't like to take a live feed or I'm sorry, a, a pelleted feed, uh, but that can be done. You can feed train these fish. Uh, that's probably a whole nother topic for another day, but I've, I've feed trained millions of these guys. Um, it is doable. Um, but in terms of collecting a collection, uh, my preference uh, for largemouth bass is I prefer the, uh, a two pound, one kilo female or better. I like to stay under uh, eight pounds, which I'm not super quick on a fly with that kilo conversion. So we'll say less than four kilos. Uh, only because as we've got, I've, I've spawned a lot of different sized fish. Uh, the males, of course, don't get that big. And when you're dealing with the Florida largemouth bass variant, uh, if you use eight pound, nine pound, 10 pound females, uh, they're harder to handle. They eat a lot of live forage that you got to keep these guys on and they eat the males. They get mad at the males. I'm, I'm using humanistic traits. I'm sorry, but they get mad at the males and they eat the males and I lose broodfish. Um, and it's just not worth it. They, they give you a lot of eggs. I've had one female just in one spawn give me over 50,000 eggs, but that's not common. It's just not worth it. I prefer the like I said, the two to eight pound females for the Florida largemouth bass, the regular largemouth bass, or what people down in the south say, the northern largemouth bass, which I don't like. It's not a northern, it's the largemouth bass. Um, uh, I might go a little bit smaller, but I still prefer the the, the two to, really the two to five on the, lar on the, on the largemouth bass. Um, it's really important to handle these things correctly when you're moving your broodfish. Uh, salt, uh, is a mainstay uh moving them at lower temperatures and when i mean you know down here in the south we we get above temperatures that the bass above 80 degrees 85 degrees all the time they they can be handled but you've got to use salt and you need to use uh i like to use ms triple two uh, these are brood fish that never leave the site ever so we are not breaking any rules by using ams triple two because you can't release a fish that has been under MS triple two for 21 days. It's got a 21 day withdrawal period. Uh, we do not use these on our eggs or fry. Of course, that would be silly. Um, but the salt, salt is really good. But I like to use a, a really a, a seven parts per thousand uh, salt. And I, I can leave you can leave those fish on that indefinitely. You will not kill fish at seven parts per thousand. You will not kill fish at 10 parts per thousand. So even if you miss, you won't kill those fish as long as you have respectable water quality. We always have to remember that water quality changes from site to site. Uh, and I'm talking about alkalinity above 50 ppm, pH between six and nine, uh, oxygen above six, um, you know, the standard stuff that, you know, folks probably in this room probably already know about. So there's no reason to go into it unless if somebody has a specific question, then by all means, we can talk about it. Uh, so, Another thing I like to do is I don't like to handle my brood fish more than I have to. So I like to bring them in and get them situated and get them paired up. 
if you're spawning on a flat bottom surface, meaning not in a pond, um, they don't readily spawn on just flat concrete. So you can come in and mix, put them, pair them up, and they won't start spawning right away. They also like to, I like to bring them together like that to get, I keep my broodfish, males and females, separate all year. I prefer to give them a, a week uh, to get acquainted. Um, it's hard to talk about reproduction without using silly words like, you know, getting reacquainted, dating, whatever you want to call it. Again, these are humanistic traits, but uh, it's what we have to do. I'm not going to break out the Barry Manilow or anything like that, but we, we, we want them to get used to each other and then we'll supply the mats. So what I like to do is the Spontex mats, which you don't know what Spontex mats are. Um, um, we can talk about that too, but in an 80 foot raceway, uh, I like to put 30 females and 20 males. Um, we can uh, dumb that down to different size tanks, but I like to use uh, whatever that ratio would be, a 1.5 to 1 uh, female to male ratio. Another standard ratio is uh, 1 to 1, where you put 20 males and 20 females together. Um, I've done more males. You can do that if you've got broodstock that are used to being in raceways. Uh, if you don't, you, and if you have younger fish, Florida bass do better than the largemouth bass in terms of being crowded. Uh, the largemouth bass, especially the younger ones, will spend more time chasing each other around. The males will. But the 80-foot uh, raceway, which is kind of a standard raceway at hatcheries, for largemouth bass anyway, is uh, that's about a six-foot uh, space between mats. You space your mats out six feet, um, and the, the raceways, I'm sorry, are eight feet across. So once you establish that, the males can have enough space. They don't seem to want to waste time fighting. You'll, you'll get a little bit. And what you'll find is in the females will swim up and down the middle of the mats. They can actually get away from the males um, if need be, swimming up and down the middle of the raceways. And you, uh, you give some somewhat, you, you've given them only 20 males to select from, but at least you allow them to select. And we found that we can get a tremendous amount of uh, spawns this way instead of just pairing one to one um, because you never know the, the fish's attitudes toward each other, I guess. Um, so we'll put, I like to use a 30 to 30 females to 20 male ratio. And that way, because the males, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll find a mat and they'll go to coaxing in a female. Um, you've, I can, I've got pictures of it, but you got one to two males on a mat sometimes. I'm sorry, females, never two males, but one to two females on a mat. And then once you remove the mat the next day, which is what we like to do, they'll spawn, um, say, on Tuesday. And then you come in the next day, you can pick that mat up. And we'll, we'll I'll talk about that in a little bit and replace that mat. And many times that male will get right back on that mat and um, try to spawn again which is what we're after. The, the whole point of what we're trying to do is spawn as many fish as possible, as fast as possible, so that we can turn around and stock fry, hatch fry out into our one acre ponds at the density we, we want. We don't wanna stock fewer fish out there because now we're wasting pond space in terms of an aquaculture setting. Um, so we'll do that. Uh, we have several raceways and it's, it's very successful. Uh, this, this method works really well for creating fry. Uh, which then we can turn, put out in ponds and create fingerling. Uh, when you get to making the larger sized fish, which you see on the, uh, I guess would be the left side of the screen, uh, good luck. Uh, it can be done, but again, this is a predator. They, they don't act like bluegill. Uh, they will eat each other. They are a pain when it comes to that. It is completely possible, but expect some losses to uh, predation. And you've really got to start knocking down your stocking densities. Uh, we can't get into everything today, but there is a book out there now by uh, James Tidwell. I don't know where I put it. I got it out. Uh, oh, Largemouth Bass Aquaculture. It's edited by James Tidwell, Sean Coyle, and Leanne Bright. Uh, if you're interested in that, that, that goes, it's got a lot of different chapters in it uh, for just basically on largemouth bass aquaculture. It's a pretty good book. Another book you can get if you like to read is The Practical Hatchery Management of Warm Water Fishes by Jack Snow and Ron Phelps. Uh, those are both pretty good books uh, on this subject. And then the, the Ron Phelps book has other species in it. So uh, egg acquisition, 
using the sizes of females that I that I recommend, uh, you can get very steadily. And I, one thing I'll tell you is we don't count the eggs. They're, they're stuck to mats. It's, it's not worth it. Uh, so when we say we get this many eggs per spawn, we only know that based on the swim up fry that we get from those spawns. Uh, and sometimes we'll have 20 spawns in a in a holding um, shipping holding and shipping trough or raceway, whatever you want to call it, the vat that we put them in. And so we'll just take the total number and divide it by the number of spawns. So you have to understand that we're not giving you the number of eggs, but very, very commonly we'll, we'll be between 8,000 and 12,000 swim up fry per spawn. So we just use that as 8,000 to 12,000 eggs per spawn. I just want to set that up so you, you're clear that uh, we do not count the eggs. They're, they're stuck on the mats and we don't, that, it's not worth counting them off. But again, we're all about the numbers. Uh, we can get anybody that wants to get into the nitty gritty, just send me a, a question or something like that. I do have answers, uh, but I'm speaking kind of a, a higher top end so we can cover more um, information. Um, so it's real important that during the spawning season, if you're going to spawn this way, you've got your largemouth bass in one raceway and you have to move your eggs uh, as everybody knows eggs are pretty sensitive to temperature changes and largemouth bass eggs are no different um, they're more pliable than the early hatched fry the weakest you're going to deal with is the the one day old two day old newly hatched fry those are the ones most susceptible to temperature changes so you want to be real careful the eggs can handle some but if you're spawning at 20 degrees uh, celsius then as long as you're putting those eggs in a, in a trough to incubate around that same temperature, you know, 19, 20, 21, you'll be fine. Um, I do have um, uh, in a typical spawning season, uh, I've got a bunch of different data here, but you can see this is from uh, a couple of raceways. You can see that uh, we the spawning temperature in red correlates to uh, the left side of the of the table and you've got the number of spawns on the I'm sorry on the right side of the table and the number of spawns on the left um, this is just I could make up a bunch of these this is just typically what we see um, spawning even though we spawn inside we're doing this all inside it does correlate with temperature changes um, low pressure systems things like that uh, so uh, they're actually very easy to spawn as long as you follow uh, a pretty simple regime. Um, there's just an example, just trying to get some pictures in here because we're sitting here talking about stuff. Um, I'm hanging the mats in a, that's a 30 foot uh, trough, um, typical mat. Uh, the bass do a pretty good job of hitting the center of these mats. It's not always perfect, but that's a, that's a decent spawn. Um, nice yellow color to the eggs. Uh, and we hang those vertically as you saw. And this in this picture here, we do that because as these eggs hatch, uh, they'll just drop right out onto the floor. And that's what that first picture was early on when I had it up was newly hatched fry. And they just sit on the ground or on the bottom of the tank until they swim up. And that is temperature dependent. We'll get into that in the middle in a, in a minute. Um, I'm not going to get into this either. But again, it's something there is information out there. I did publish some of this, actually. If anybody's interested, largemouth bass, now up where your guys are at, and I wish I was up there where you guys are at right now because it's a 100 degrees here. Uh, I don't know if this one is going to work too well up north, uh, but down down in the south, we actually uh, developed a way to spawn without using chemical uh, to fall spawn these these fish, and it's, it was pretty interesting. The number of spawns was thinned out a little bit, and the, the eggs went down uh, the number of again it's based on fry but where we would average 8,000 to 12,000 fry per spawn we would get uh five to five to seven really in the fall but it actually worked out really well if the goal of what you're trying to raise is a larger fish um when you're stocking these things you're if you spawn these in a hatchery you're stocking them up against the same size as if you would out in the wild um if you want the best success this, depending on the program. Really, I don't know what program you're running. So it depends on your conservation program, your numbers program, put and take fishery program. If you want to stock fish that have a, a better chance of, of getting the surviving against what Mother Nature is already producing in these in these uh, systems that you're stocking, uh, we would produce these in the fall. This is where I feed train them. I would feed train 
hundreds of thousands of largemouth or Florida largemouth bass. And we would raise them over winter inside in tanks in those 80 foot raceways. And we would have them up to a hundred millimeters in, in March. And then we could stock a hundred millimeter bass. This was actually in Florida, not in Texas. Um, in in March. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it. There is information out there on it. I don't know. Um, we didn't have to do a whole lot of work because our water is so warm down here. Uh, it actually worked out. But uh, what I was trying to get to, it's all fun. Um, that's just a picture of, those are some fish that we did feed train. Uh, it is, a, 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 a walleye is, is, is a really awesome species. And I, I know I talked to Alan Johnson quite a bit about some walleye stuff because we, we work on a lot of the same problems with just with different species. Um, but it's neat when you get a tank of largemouth bass feed trained uh, that thick. They're they they're insatiable eaters. Um, it is it is quite an awesome sight to watch and feed. I've had some video of it. It's it's it's, it's kind of cool. But anyway, um, what I wanted to get to was just here's some numbers I wanted to throw at you. I think you wanted to see. Don't worry about the the Kissimmee St. John region, but um, this is what we're looking at in terms of some of the information for largemouth, for Florida largemouth bass. Uh, in the fall, you can see that the, the fry per spawn, don't worry about that, it's in the fall, but uh, the fry per gram for largemouth bass, if you ever do want to deal with fry per gram, um, they usually fluctuate. Uh, it depends on the size of the fish. If you've got smaller fish, you're going to have more fry per gram. If you deal with larger fish, of course, they're going to get bigger, so you're going to have less fry per gram. A good average is usually between 275 and 300 fry per gram. Um, if you're, that's that's swim up fry. That's the swim up fry size. That's when they're just starting to swim up and you're getting ready to stock them out in ponds. Um, so with that, that'll work for that. All right, so moving on with, with, with spawning. Temperature. Temperature, I was already talking about that, is real important. Um, when you're trying to raise fish and, and harvest these things, they're very sensitive to temperature changes. But if you've got the ability to work on, to hold your temperature you, you're, and control your temperature, you're going to be in much better shape. Um, I did do some more work on that. If you try to hatch largemouth bass eggs, now this is largemouth bass eggs at you know 18 degrees, which is a very common temperature. Um, they're going to take longer to hatch than if you're trying to hatch them at say uh, 23 degrees. That's pretty much common sense. But the big take home of that is, is saprolegnia is nobody's friend in this business. And at 18 degrees, uh, it might take those fish. It's it's going to take those fish, you know, four or five days to hatch or longer. And you get, you know, a few dead eggs and all of a sudden you got saprolating growing all over your mat and it can suffocate your eggs on the mat. So if one of the big things, I know a lot of places can't do this, but one of the things, if you can moderate your temperature changes while your eggs are incubating, that is going to save you a tremendous amount of effort, money, time. All of everything that you're that we worry about in aquaculture because you, you're going to get better production of a single spawn if you can keep uh, even if you can't heat your water if you can moderate the temperature swings. Uh, we had some some times where we were down to 62 degrees at night and we the water temperature would swing back up to 72 during the day, um, but we were still having all kinds of water loss. Now the temperature itself, or I'm sorry, water loss, fry loss. But the temperature itself was not the issue. What the issue was, was it was elongating the period that these fish were being incubated, causing problems. So I, once I was able to moderate just using temperature, uh, my percent hatch uh, went up dramatically. It was actually pretty impressive. Um, we would have um, 70 or 80 percent hatch. I did a study uh, testing this because we don't count eggs. I took I randomly selected 30 spawns, 30 mats um, for spawning, and I cut out 30 sections from 30 mats, and we counted the eggs. We did that. That was it was a it was a lot of counting, and then we would hang those each individual sections. I had a little tiny square in a hundred foot and a hundred gallon tank, and we we did this 30 times so I could have good repetition, because that's one thing I like in studies. I don't like three or four. I prefer six 
if I could do more of this one, I did 30. Um, I wanted to see what would happen if we just left them on ambient versus putting them on ambient and holding the temperature constant. And holding the temperature constant increased, greatly increased uh, hatching success. Uh, we also put in, I don't know, folks have used uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, it is labeled for uh, aquaculture use. I've run into a few folks in the business that they like hydrogen peroxide, but they don't use it because you have to use it. <sighs> you know, okay. It's labeled to use at 750 to 1,000 ppm. Um, that's that's pretty high. It works, and as long as you're treating eggs, you're absolutely fine. Uh, it works out great. It keeps saprolegnia at bay, um, along with some other stuff. But if your eggs hatch for some reason while they're under the treatment, like I mean, you're only treating them for for an hour, uh, but then you have to flush it out. And even if that, that could take some time. So e even if they're trying to, you're trying to flush out that hydrogen peroxide, eggs can hatch. Those fry are susceptible to that. Like I said, those are newly hatched fry are pretty weak. Um, you could actually kill some of your fry. So by using the hydrogen peroxide, I was getting 91% uh, hatch. Uh, using hydrogen peroxide, that's with uh, holding the temperature at 23 degrees. If you use hydrogen peroxide at say an ambient temperature, say at 18, I was getting 79% hatch. Um, so that's 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 still really good. That's not that's not I'm not going to complain about that at all. But so I that led me to do another study. And I don't know Mark Gakowski. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He's up there. He was up there in Wisconsin, uh, La Crosse, I think. Um, we did the same study different times, and what we did was we were looking at hydrogen peroxide concentrations on eggs as the fry hatched. Um, we both came up with the exact same data, which was really interesting. The, as long as you're under 300 ppm of hydrogen peroxide and, and a fry hatches, you've got a good chance that those fry are going to survive. Uh, as we got higher, we would we would hold the we would hold the uh, eggs under a constant uh, hydrogen peroxide concentration above 300. We did we both did 500, 750,000. Um, it was killing fry as they hatched. Now it wasn't total kill. We had it was like fifty four percent survival at those at those levels, but under those levels, uh, mortality decreased greatly, and and there was no significant difference between zero and three hundred uh, on on newly hatched fry because you know you're going to have some mortality here or there. Uh, so one of the things that folks got a little upset with with the hydrogen peroxide was that was killing their fry. So when you use that uh, treatment, if you're going to use peroxide treatment on your eggs, which I do recommend if you if you can, is pay attention to your water temperatures. Pay attention when you think they're going to hatch, um, and be careful. You know you can use the 750, but make sure you get it flushed out of there um, once you're done. And you got you got to plan your if you start you think you're going to start hatching that day, you got to plan to have that flushed out uh, in time. So. Um, some people like to use other chemicals and things like that, but I, I do like hydrogen peroxide. It works very well uh, for this purpose. So uh, once we get the egg, the eggs in the, in, the, in the containers, it becomes pretty simple in the raceway, actually, is we'll collect those out. We'll, we, we, do egg, we do fry counts. I recommend doing fry counts if your brood stock changes, if your brood stock size changes. Because it can make a difference on the back end of your stocking density of how much you stock based on what your expected survival in your pond would be. So when you've got smaller fish, you're going to probably be above 300 fry per gram, which we've talked about. I mean, you get to have four, five, six pound females. You are probably going to start to dip down below 300. It is very reasonable. As it takes a lot of time to do this, to use a 300 fry per gram, and you're going to be pretty safe. Uh, sometimes... Uh, here in Texas, we'll we'll use a 375 because we have some pretty large. Uh, I'm sorry, a 275 because we have some pretty large broodfish, and that serves us well. Um, if in a well fertilized, if you have good water quality, what I mean by good water quality, it's 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 optimal to the parameters of the largemouth bass. Uh, we will stock uh, here at 150,000 fry per acre. I'm expecting. 60 to 65, maybe 70% return. We get that, we get much higher than that sometimes, but we have to temper that with a few occasions where we get 
uh, a 30 or 40 percent where you know, the zooplankton just didn't take and we lose fry pretty early. Um, and we'll try to grow those out to uh, 38 millimeters. That's our standard size. It's trying to grow our fingerling out to 38 or fry into fingerling out to 30 millimeters, which takes 24 to 33 days, depending on temperatures. Once your temperatures reach, uh, you know, they get up to about 23 in the ponds. Those things can grow pretty quickly. Um, there's not a whole lot of temperature issues, I would I would say, with largemouth bass. You have to deal with minus. Just be careful when you change it from real quickly. Now, not in a pond. You can't change that quickly. But um, one thing that I've noticed uh, in Florida and in Texas, because we do get so warm, is there they, I have not done a study on this, so I can't prove it to you. But I've been around this business long enough to know that I'm never going to raise largemouth bass, Florida largemouth bass eggs above 27 degrees Celsius. Um, they start, you start to pick up a tremendous amount of malformed fish. Um, again, I haven't studied it. I have talked to some experts on it and kind of just going back and forth. Uh, we believe that that's, that's making the fry grow too fast. And what the malformation usually is, is they look like, uh, like a check mark where they're, it looks like a bent back, but um, their tail's above their head, uh, like in a check mark fashion. And they survive, but they don't survive long in the ponds, and then they're not going to do well in the wild. So you don't want stocking those things. So uh, my recommendation is do is not to let your water temperatures get above 20. I, I, I like to stay 26.5. It's not common, but it does happen here. Um, it gets pretty warm pretty quick, and it also happened a lot in Florida. I do not expect... Uh, folks in the Midwest to be running up against that too often um, and late raising largemouth bass. So stay away from, from those higher temperatures. Cooler temperatures work fine. It just elongates spawning and you're going to have more saprolagnia issues. Um, so be careful with that. I would recommend, you know, if you're going to, if you're looking into doing largemouth bass, um, the, fr the putting the fry out in the ponds or in some fertilized uh, water body is easiest. Uh, I know there's a lot of work being done right out of hatch, putting them on um, Noplii or putting them on, uh, I don't know, I've, I've, the, the last speaker, I think she said Odeheme or Odeheme, I've heard it both ways. I don't, I, I mean, I'm not sure what's, what it's called, but that's a great feed, by the way, putting it on some Odeheme, putting this fry on Odeheme, real small micro diet, um, moving them up to uh, Odehemi C1, which is what I used when I feed train. Um, that can be done too. It's very intensive and I don't know how many fish you're going to need, but if you're dealing with wanting a lot of fish, uh, I think pond is easiest. Um, it doesn't take much. They do well out there. They handle pretty well and you bring them back in. Um, and uh, let's see some other, I wrote down a list of pitfalls to watch out for in spawning and, and rearing largemouth bass. Uh, another thing is when you uh, stock a pond with largemouth bass uh, or Florida largemouth bass. You can play with temperatures, but let's not get into the sidebars here. Uh, three days, if you have fish spawned on a Monday, Tuesday, or and then Wednesday, it's very safe to put all those together in the same pond, to stock the same pond. All the way up to five days is okay. Uh, sometimes you have to put seven days worth of fry out there because you're trying to maximize space. Uh, the best way to do that is say you, if you're going to stock at 150,000 uh, fry per acre, you want to put the largest group in first. You don't want to put 20,000 uh, fish out there on a Monday and then come back and put 120,000 in there on a Friday, um, just in case if those those first 20,000 really, really get on it and do well, expect a lower return. I mean, it, it all depends on what return you're expecting. A um, little pit, pitfall there, but three days is not an issue with these fish. If you've got a system that allows you to do this, you can hatch and you, you want to maximize your pond space. You can actually spawn fish um, and either cool the first couple of days down and take make them take two or three days longer to hatch or let them hatch and then cool them down so that it elongates, it elongates the process before they swim up. And then you have the another group behind them where you don't moderate that. You let them stay on warmer temperatures. And by the time you stock them, they're basically the same size. They're different aged fish, but they, it breaks that rule. You can stock those very safely together. Um, but one won't outgrow the other unless there's genetics involved. And you won't know that until you harvest your fish, but just based on temperature. Temperature is very important. 
It's one of the biggest things to deal with with largemouth bass. Um, so that's really most of the pitfalls. There's there's they handle they handle peroxide well. They handle uh, fry handle well. To get a soft net when you're scooping the the, the fry. You can actually get these uh, fry off the bottom if you're careful. Um, depending on what you need to do, they they come off the bottom even if they're not swim up very well. And you can put them in the tank. And then what I like to do is I don't want to handle them any more than I have to. You rig up a tank and you just shoot them out underwater. You just have a you don't want to when I say shoot you don't want this you know high pressure system on them. But you just gradually siphon them out of the tank and we use the four inch hose on the bottom with a cam lock on the bottom of the tank and literally shot them underwater. You don't let them get above water. We put them right on the steps of the kettle. And we saw no difference in doing that versus when we would shoot out the uh, swim up fry. Um, I prefer to wait for swim up fry, but if you have to, if you need the space, you know, aquaculture, there's always things going on that, you know, usually you're doing more than one species. You gotta, you gotta move along. The, they are, they uh, don't let people tell you that you can't handle uh, a three day old hatched fry. You can, uh, you just gotta be super careful. Uh, the swim up fry are actually very pliable when you put them in. Uh, we use, just use those cheap aquarium blue or white, the real soft sided nets, uh, real fine mesh. Um, you scoop those up. You actually make a little ball with your hand to wring the water out a little bit, not a lot. And then you just, you don't want to have too much water weight, but you don't want to dry them out either. They have no problem handling that to, to get your uh, fry weights. Um, they will, they, they are, you, you got to be careful putting them in a five gallon bucket, moving them around at large numbers because you will kill them. Um, they do pull oxygen out of water. It's pretty impressive how quickly, just as all species will. But uh, what we got to deal with with warm water, I'm jealous about cool water and cold water aquaculture is, you know, we're sitting there at 8, 8 ppm, 9 ppm um, oxygen, but man, we're doing great. This is really high oxygen. Uh, just because oxygen doesn't hold as well in warm water as it does in the cooler and cold. So you guys get to deal with, you know, 10, 12, 13. Now we can make it that way, but uh, I've always liked that about cold water and, and, you know, walleye and trout, especially, I've always been very impressed with the, the handling ability of trout uh, and because of that cold water um, and the pliability of the oxygen systems and stuff. Um, one other thing to deal with when you're moving fry is you do not want the uh, uh, oxygen in the in the tank to get above 15 ppm. Um, if you're moving them again, let me set the stage again one more time in warm water settings. If you're 24 degrees, 23 degrees, 20 degrees, you don't want to be above 15. Um, there's no reason to be above 15 because to, to, to get that you're you're putting the air stone in there um, and controlling that yourself anyway. Uh, we did a study on Guadalupe bass, um, not Florida bass. Uh, we actually did another study on Florida and, and largemouth, and the Florida bass was actually the most pliable when it comes to dealing with this particular parameter. But there's no reason to waste oxygen. But we did find we would we would start having issues with uh, the Guadalupe bass above 15. Uh, nothing terrible. Once it got above 20, we did see a marked decrease in survival. And now again, these are newly hatched fry into just you know swim up fry. We're not talking about fingerling here. Um, so be careful with that. There's no um, now if you're at uh, 15 degrees, that changes the ball game. So my study did not take into account cold water, cool water. So we were dealing with warm water and warm water. I'd say anything above 20. So uh, that's just another thing to look out for. Sometimes when we're stocking fry out, you know, you get your fry hauler out and you get your oxygen bottle out there and you roll that oxygen in there. Something happens. You're like, everything's safe. You're fine. You come back 20 minutes later. You start loading your fry into the tank and you pop your DO meter in there, which it should already be in there anyway. And you start to look at that and you're like, oh, I'm at 24. You know, uh, stop what you're doing. Maybe add a little extra water. Get that down uh, below 20 for sure. And I prefer 15. Um, but again, uh I'm just, we're just trying to safeguard against, you know, it, it's difficult and all the ways fish can die. Then you got to try to figure out why they're dying. So safeguard yourself and pull all the variables you can, and uh, you'll be good to go. Um, everything I've said today, it, it, there, there's flexibility in, in raising largemouth bass. You can uh, pull these, these ratios down and, sp and spawn them in much smaller tanks. You can spawn them one to one in tanks if you're worried if you're if you're more interested about traits and things like that. 
Um, I don't like doing that, but again, I'm after large numbers, not after just one or two spawns. So spawning just one on one in a, in around 500 gallon tank works. Uh, but you know, I don't see why you don't hedge your bets and put two females in there and one male. Um, even if you're spawning spawning in small tanks, um, again, depending on what you want from the from your program or from what you're actually trying to do. If you just want a few fish, then you're fine. One of the myths uh, on largemouth bass: if you're spawning largemouth bass, Florida largemouth bass, you and we have to move the mats. And you're, if you're pulling the mats out of the raceway to incubate them in another tank or trough, um, if it's if your water temperature is 19 degrees. 20 degrees and your ambient air temperature is 18, 19, 20, 21, you can lift that mat out of the water, put it in a tub of water and you'll be fine. It can handle that small. I mean, I've even grabbed those mats and walked around an 80 foot raceway to put into a tub and saw no difference in, in, in hatch. I didn't have any issues with those when we did those small studies that I was talking about. Um, but you got to be careful having folks do that because they'll get used to doing that. And then you have one of those wonderful mornings where, you know, the water temperature is 21 degrees and you're out there collecting bass at the ambient air temperature is 10. Um, that is enough to shock those eggs if you pull those out and hold them out of the water for too long. So you got to watch out for that. Um, you can't temperature shock bass eggs that way. Um, so you need to watch out for that. Okay. Um, I think we've covered uh, the egg, the egg and fry stages of largemouth bass.